Harvesting cotton was labor-intensive, and in order to keep the gins fed in the sparsely populated South, farmers would require an enormous new workforce, as Stephen F. Austin quickly learned. Stephen Austin, and his father before him, had seen the explosive growth of cotton across the South. They were confident that they could build a colony based upon it. In 1821, Austin had called for farmers who would plant cotton and mechanics who would build gins to join him in Texas. Among those that answered the call was Jared Elson Gross. Gross was an aggressive entrepreneur whose attitudes would dramatically shape the cotton industry and Texas. In 1821, Gross heard Austin's call, and that same year he packed his family and belongings on 50 wagons and set out for Texas. Gross also brought 90 slaves to the new colony, quickly making him the wealthiest Anglo in the territory. While slavery offended the morality of the Mexican government and raised concerns for Austin, they did not stop the peculiar institution from gaining a foothold in Texas. As soon as he arrived in Texas, Gross planted his first cotton crop, and it was immediately clear that Austin's vision would be realized. The upland cotton that was grown across the South and had been seen by Cabeza de Vaca grew in the colony like nowhere else. While the best farms along the Mississippi River could expect to get a thousand pounds of cotton per acre, Austin's land was nearly three times as productive. Austin wrote of his colony's cotton. Our cotton is of a superior quality and produces very well. The average height of cotton on the bottom lands is from nine to 12 feet and yields generally 2,500 to 3,000 pounds to the acre. The success of the colony's crops made the need for gins immediately apparent. By 1825, Gross had erected the first gin in the colony. By 1828, Austin's colony had at least five gins, and more had been built in East Texas. Austin's success quickly drew more Anglos into the state, and the colonial presence quickly expanded west along the road to San Antonio. Texas's independence and subsequent statehood had only increased this expansion. When Spain had called for colonists to move to Texas, her population, excluding Native Americans, was fewer than 3,000 people. By 1835, there were more than 35,000 people, and this number would double in the next five years. By 1850, there were more than 210,000 people in the state. Cotton planters came from Georgia, Alabama, Mississippi, and the Carolinas, intending to establish plantations in the image of the South. This plantation culture made it as far as the Cibolo Creek, where in 1846, planters began buying large tracts of land. Just as Gross had, these planters brought cotton gins to the area. Correspondence indicates that the first cotton gin in the area may have been a gift by Stephen F. Austin to his Mexican friend, Don Erasmo Seguin. Plantation gins quickly sprang up along the Cibolo Creek. These plantation gins were based on Whitney and Holmes's designs, but were capable of processing much more cotton than those original models. The cotton gin machine, known as a gin stand, was now placed in a building known as a gin plant. These plants were originally a single story with a basement to collect the processed lint. Gone was the original hand crank, giving way to animal power. By the 1820s, two-story plants were not uncommon. A two-story gin allowed animals to turn a wheel on the first floor and then transfer the power of the gin stand to the second floor. Early Texas had few roads, and they were all bad. They were uh, no more than paths cut through the brush that could be traveled by ox cart. So remote plantations, greatly scattered, sparse, sparsely populated in the area, each had to have its own cotton gin. Uh, that meant that it's, it remained a time-consuming process. There were no community gins, and ginning began on the plantation at the end of the harvest season and continued all the way through the winter to the next spring planting. Uh, cotton production became a year-round affair in Texas. 
The planters brought with them their way of life from the Old South. They brought household goods and began building plantation homes. Like the Texas settlements to the east, life on the Cibolo Creek would be built on the foundation of cotton. The planters also brought their most valued assets, their slaves. By 1860, there were as many slaves as white settlers living along the banks of the Cibolo. Cotton production had exploded across the southern United States following the adoption of the cotton gin, and the rapid expansion of slavery had closely followed. When Whitney had introduced his creation, there were fewer than 700,000 slaves in the United States. In fewer than 70 years, that number would increase to 4 million. Cotton had become the undisputed king across the southern United States, and Texas had a growing share of that kingdom. 